Nuke Talk is a podcast brought to you by Plowshares, the largest foundation solely focused on reducing the threat of nuclear weapons. The creation and production of the atomic bomb left its mark not only on U.S. foreign policy, but on the cities where production was centered, and the lives and relationships of the people who lived in those cities. We're talking about nuclear weapons' influence on race, socioeconomic status, and the environment, and how all of that has carried on to modern day. And today we're taking a trip to Aiken, South Carolina, where the Savannah River site resides. After closing the nuclear weapons facility in 1988, the federal government poured $8 billion into a project aimed at converting surplus plutonium from the U.S. nuclear weapons program into fuel for nuclear power plants. But the project was canceled after 11 years once lawmakers realized that it would likely cost billions more and take decades longer than estimated. So how did that billion-dollar project fail so greatly? And why was there a decision afterwards to shift the plant back to producing parts for nuclear weapons? Much like the other towns talked about previously on this podcast, the story of Savannah River site is one of institutionalized secrecy and environmental and physical harm. But something we haven't touched on that much is the way small towns in the U.S. are economically dependent on nuclear weapons and the defense industry, and how politics and financial interests keep the nuclear weapons industry afloat. That is an important part of today's story, and it starts like this. On November 28, 1950, just a few days after Thanksgiving, the Atomic Energy Commission announced that they would be acquiring 250,000 acres in the Aiken and Barnwell counties of South Carolina near the Savannah River, in addition to announcing that about 1,500 families would have to relocate. The one-page, carefully worded press release stated that operations at the Savannah River plants would not involve the manufacturing of the atomic weapon. Notably, the release did not specify what would be produced at the plant, It simply stated that produced materials could be used for either weapons or fuels for power purposes. Despite the vague statement, rumors grew around locals that an H-bomb factory was coming to town, and the media quickly began to refer to Savannah River's site as the H-bomb factory, or simply the bomb factory, though the AEC did technically keep its word. No nuclear weapons have ever been physically manufactured at the Savannah River site. Instead, the plant played a key part during the Cold War by producing the essential elements for nuclear weapons, plutonium and tritium. We talked to Taylor Barnes about the impact of plutonium production on the local community during the Cold War and what happened after the military boom ended. She's the field reporter for the military industrial complex with Inkstick Media a nonprofit outlet that covers national and human security. By policy, Inkstick does not accept funds from defense contractors or government entities that could represent a matter of conflict. This was a rural corner of South Carolina that was flooded and flooded with thousands of workers um, and their families, often living in sort of, you know, shoddy, very temporary construction. To me, there was this great visual contrast of people living in, you know, just these makeshift homes to build the site while building, you know, the technological marvel, if you will, or great technological achievement of the age, which was splitting the atom and making it into a warhead. So there was this really big contrast on the ground of scrabbling to get by and living in, you know, pretty precarious conditions while making some, you know, something so technologically advanced. So, of course, that radically changed, you know, the area around the Savannah River site. You know, you might hear people refer to Aiken, South Carolina, as, you know, the sort of anchor town. It's a small town. I don't want to overstate how large it is. Um, But remember, the Savannah River site is over 300 square miles. There's multiple small towns and counties that ring it. So, of course, it's both radically changed, um, radically changed the area and changed the nature of the local economy and brought so many people in that would not have otherwise lived there. Um, but also the, the the motors of the local economy that existed before the Savannah River site continued and go on. I mean, to this day, equestrian ranges and horseback riding is kind of the uh, the secondary industry of the of the area around Savannah River and Aiken, which is kind of delightful for those of us in the nuclear world who, of course, know Aiken and the Savannah River site as a nuclear weapons site to go there and meet people who are like, oh, yes, I live near a nuclear plant. 
but really I'm here for my horses. So that goes on and that's alive and well today. So shutting down the reactors at the end of the Cold War then meant that the Savannah River site had largely a cleanup mission. It did maintain one nuclear weapons mission, which is the production of tritium. That said, the vast majority of the, the lion's share of the workforce was employed on cleanup, which, you know, is both extremely important for the surrounding community, is a job creator, and then also is an area of innovation. I mean, the Savannah River site hosts labs where, you know, where cleanup of hazardous waste is studied. It's worth noting that to this day, as the um, South Carolina Environmental Department, the state's you know, environmental agency, defines the Savannah River site as the largest environmental threat and hazard in the state because of its aging tanks of toxic waste that are held beneath ground. So um, anyhow, the end of the Cold War for the Savannah River site meant it largely transitioned to a cleanup project, one which was a massive generator of employment because the task is daunting. In 1988, at the conclusion of the Cold War, all five reactors at Savannah River site were shut down. And the next year, the DOE announced that the new mission would be to transition to environmental management of the site's waste. Also in 1988, two congressional hearings revealed that over 30 significant incidents, which included the melting of fuel and extensive radioactive contamination of the environment, occurred at the facility and were kept from the public eye over the span of three decades. For the critics of the nuclear weapons industry in the late 90s, an October article by the New York Times about the hearings captured their sentiments succinctly, stating that the long history of the incidents at the Savannah River site, quote, raises a new questions about the willingness of the Energy Department to correct long-standing managerial and structural problems at the aging plant. These questions must be asked again in regards to the failed MOX project that came just a few years later at the Savannah River site. Around the turn of the century, the US and Russia entered into an ambitious agreement to clean up the legacy of the Cold War and the massive amounts of plutonium that both countries had produced as tensions had escalated. The plan was to get rid of 34 tons of weapon-grade plutonium and other nuclear materials, mostly through MOX factories, that would mix these materials to make pellets that would power nuclear reactors. It was an ambitious non-proliferation project. By the way, MOX is short for mixed oxide. It gets its name from the combination of two oxidized nuclear metals, plutonium and uranium. When the Bush administration announced the MOX plan in 2002, the first of its kind in the U.S., it was called an affordable technology. The estimated cost then was $3.8 billion to construct over 20 years. There were a few skeptics, such as former Republican Congressman David Hobson, a self-described fiscal conservative who called MOX the biggest, baddest earmark of all time. He eventually lowered his resistance to the project, though in 2016, in an essay he wrote for Project on Government Oversight, he stated that he only did so after being pressured by his fellow Republicans, who told him that the cancellation of the project would hurt then-South Carolina Governor Mark Sanford's chances of being re-elected. Hobson doubled down in his essay, saying, quote, the project was never about good policy, just politics. On paper, though, it seemed like a pretty good swords into plowshare story. However, the great issue with this proposal all along was that U.S. nuclear power plants didn't particularly have a demand to use such fuel and did not have a plan to use it. So the commercial viability, i.e. the government would pay to construct this plant to get rid of and transform its uh, Cold War era plutonium. However, without a clear plan for U.S. private companies, commercial companies to actually use that plutonium in their plants, and this became pretty visible in the early years of MOX getting underway. So I would say the MOX plant, which if you can imagine, if you can think of the Savannah River site as this 300 square mile, you know, nuclear weapons plant and former nuclear weapons plant, MOX is one large complex within it. However, it is, you know, it is not the entire plant, of course. This became sort of the, the focal point, I think, if you will, of the Savannah River site because it represented perhaps this opportunity to try to turn it around and turn it into a swords and the plowshares story. However, many critics rang the alarm bell pretty early on about the fact that this would this really pointed out to being pointed to being a boondoggle. And there are other ways you can get rid of weapons grade plutonium that wouldn't have been so expensive and wouldn't have 
relied on U.S. nuclear power plants potentially using this fuel when they didn't actually have plans to. Savannah River site was chosen as the location for the government's MOX plant, in part because the state government leaders had lobbied for it, needing a new mission for the site. Crucial early support was given by James Clyburn as the then Democratic House Majority Whip, who beat back Hobson's early efforts to defeat the project. His district included part of the Savannah River site. And South Carolina Senator Lindsey Graham became one of the biggest proponents for the project earning the nickname Mr. Mox by some locals. Though it wasn't a unanimous call by South Carolina politicians for Mox, then South Carolina Governor Jim Hodges repeatedly pledged that he would lie in the middle of a road to block U.S. government trucks from hauling plutonium into his state. Because, of course, by being the location of the Mox plant, that meant that much more of the excess plutonium from across the country became consolidated in South Carolina. Hodges had serious concerns that once plutonium entered the state, its stay would be permanent rather than temporary. And on June 14, 2002, after a federal court refused Governor Hodges' request to block the incoming shipments, he declared a state emergency and ordered state troopers to block the first federal plutonium shipment from entering the state. Those blockade shipments, just to note, were being sent from the closing Rocky Flats plant in Colorado. Senator Wayne Allard, a congressman from Colorado up for re-election that year, had made cleaning up Rocky Flats' weapons plant a key part of his campaign. His re-election bid, which was a tight race, would help determine whether the Republicans would regain control of the U.S. Senate at the time. For some in South Carolina, that was enough to convince them that the Bush administration was sacrificing the interests of their state, a Republican stronghold which hadn't voted for a Democratic president since 1976 to win votes in Colorado, which is historically a swing state. Del Isham, the former executive director of the South Carolina chapter of the Sierra Club, is quoted in a 2002 LA Times article as saying that this isn't about national security, the Russians, or what's good for our country. It's all about politics. Then Governor Jim Hodges was a Democrat, though he stated that politics did not play a role in his stance and that he did not believe his state was a target for waste because he was a Democrat during a time when Republicans were in the White House. Ultimately, plutonium entered South Carolina. Hodges ended the blockade only a few days after issuing the order, once a ruling from a federal judge prohibited him from blocking shipments of bomb-grade plutonium to the state. Pretty early on, cracks started to appear in the MOX project due to design issues, poor management, and even fraud. Watchdog groups like the Savannah River Site Watch began receiving reports about improper construction at the plant. A whistleblower came forward to reveal that in 2008, rebar sold by a contractor as nuclear grade and able to withstand an earthquake had snapped under the weight of a workman's hammer. But by then, 150 tons of the bad rebar had already been embedded in the concrete. And a senior employee at a subcontractor later pleaded guilty to conspiring to commit theft to government funds. The subcontractor itself, along with the main contractor for the MOX project, was eventually sued by the Department of Justice for claiming reimbursement for construction supplies that didn't exist. Construction on the project broke ground in 2007, but by 2011, the federal government began to run out of patience. Remember, the initial estimate of the MOX project was $3.8 billion over 20 years. By 2012, the project was estimated to cost $7.7 billion and to finish in 2019. An audit of the MOX project by the Government Accountability Office in 2014 found that despite the estimated $3 billion cost increase two years prior, The NNSA had not analyzed the underlying causes of the project increases to address the agency's difficulty in completing projects within cost and schedule. Furthermore, the DOE and NNSA declined to conduct a root cause analysis against recommendations. The report ultimately cautioned that without identifying the root causes of the program construction cost increases, the NNSA's management of major projects would, quote, remain on the GAO's list of areas at high risk of fraud, waste, abuse, and mismanagement. 
Starting in 2011, the government began to pull funds from the project, though it still appropriated an additional $2 billion for six more years instead of ending the troubled project completely. And finally, in 2013, the DOE requested Congress to officially kill the program after conducting a year-long study that found that the future of the MOX project was non-viable. But proposals to end the project were defeated by influential South Carolina lawmakers, and for a few more years, the project limped along before it officially closed in 2018 under the Trump administration. By that time, $8 billion had been poured into the unfinished project, and the plant was about 70% completed. And today, the plutonium that was meant to be disposed of through the MOX project is still sitting at Savannah River site. And now the government is re-establishing the site as a plutonium production plant. But first, how does this happen? How does a government pour billions of dollars into a failed project and continue to fund it despite obvious problems? Let's break this down, starting with the economic aspect of this project. There's often an argument for these large defense contracts because of the job creation they claim to bring. Communities, especially small rural ones, tend to hold on to military contracts because they fear that without these contracts, residents will struggle to find work. And military contracts can provide prosperity to its workers through higher wages and job training. But Taylor argues that we should be cautious about these job creation claims and carefully scrutinize them. As far as what I think people should know more about this issue of economic dependence is, first off, be skeptical about job creation claims. I, I mean, if you watch this space, you will routinely see exaggeration, see shifting job creation claims, see, you know, language that suggests a given project will create, you know, thousands upon thousands of good paying jobs. But then when you get into the details, this happened when I questioned the community reuse organization in the Savannah Riverside. They walked back their claims by like many, many jobs when I actually dig out, dug in and asked them where those figures came from. And, you know, when you really actually want to get the paper trail, you can go the route of looking for economic development records, which is often, you know, asking for the, you know, your st county, your town or your state's contract with a given contractor, which they will often have some sort of an economic development incentive contract. And if you are willing to do the long public records by, uh, battle, you can indeed track down how many jobs were indeed created on that project, often through, through the economic development records. So I think my one, well, first point is just know that those job creation claims are often inflated, often exaggerated. Even in, I mean, I, when you look into the, the press release for the new intercontinental ballistic missile being manufactured, you know, in many places, but including in Utah, the language already says, you know, up to 2,250 jobs. So there's so much couching already. So I just think take that with a large grain of salt. And two, I also think there's, it's worth asking about, you know, the quality of those jobs, right? One thing that really struck me when I went to the Savannah River site was being told by locals that they, when they moved there, they were surprised to turn on their TV and see commercials for sick nuclear workers to sue the DOE for compensation for cancer. Um, that to me is is the opposite of a recruitment ad, right? That would that would tell you that this is probably not a place that you would have a healthy career. When you're hearing these job creation claims, you can also, you know, ask questions about the quality of a given job. And furthermore, when it comes to the world of defense contractors, this is, you know, I'm, I'm speaking outside of the, of the DOE at this point, it can be shocking how some of them are not paying well these days. Many of them will have two tier contracts in which the, you know, the newer entrants are earning far less than their older counterparts at the same contractor. I've been told stories of workers um, at major defense contractors who are still doing gig economy on the side, like doing Uber Eats and uh, DoorDash. So one, I think, you know, be skeptical and scrutinize job creation figures, and then also, you know, ask questions about the quality of those jobs. And Taylor told us about how the close relationship that the government and the military cultivates with the surrounding communities is intentional. It is meant to be somewhat of a codependent one. It makes that much harder for communities to divest from the nuclear and defense industries. I see that routinely in the towns I report on in a variety of locations, which is that be it the local defense contractor or the DOE contractor or, you know, the local base absolutely does integrate itself into the local community via everything from hosting the local softball tournament to hosting, you know, STEM camps for, you know, for high schoolers and for local clubs, which, you know, gives it this image of, you know, where we're a site of science, technology and engineering prowess. 
In Huntsville, Alabama, there's a whole new public school that is funded by defense contractors Northrop Grumman and Raytheon. This, this blew my mind when I saw this. But this is, I think, the way that contractors and entities with a stake in the continuation of the you know, nuclear weapons and weapons economy at large have often ingratiate themselves with local communities. And there's, you know, in many places, there are often local watchdog groups. There can be some critical press, but I think they're also very much outnumbered. There are obvious trade-offs to having a community tied so closely with nuclear weapons industry. The public has to bear a huge financial burden and environmental and health risk because of the toxic waste stored at the site. We discussed these burdens with Tom Clemens, the director of watchdog organization, the Vanna Riverside Watch. Since creating Savannah Riverside Watch in 2008, Tom has worked to spread awareness of the plant's activities. That includes having conversations about the facility with residents. Many of them do not know much about it, even though their taxes help fund these type of projects. So what is the economic reality that many residents actually experience? This is really a difficult question because DOE itself doesn't really want to answer I will say that there is a positive uh, economic impact in some sense because Savannah Riverside now has about 11,500 employees and about three fourths of those uh, live in the state of South Carolina and about a quarter of them live uh, across the Savannah River near Augusta, Georgia. Now at the height of the Cold War, there were over 25,000 people working at the site. And this is when the reactors were operating at full speed producing uh, more plutonium for nuclear weapons. I mean, which was totally crazy. But right now, the Augusta metropolitan area is about 600,000 people. So 11,500 out of those work at Savannah Riverside. So it does have an economic impact for sure. But if you look at the economic development of the area, I feel that the economic dependence on the Savannah Riverside has meant that a lot of other development has has been passed up because there's really become a dependence on the, the Savannah River site. Now, what's happening now is the, the cleanup of the site is being converted into more nuclear weapons production with very little discussion being on. And the National Nuclear Security Administration part of DOE, rather than the cleanup part of DOE, is taking over. So it's painful to watch as the contractors and their financial interests are pushing the site to more nuclear weapons production and not continuing the cleanup at the site. And in South Carolina, there's really been hardly any discussion that uh, about the site being converted more to nuclear weapons and less from cleanup. And I would add that all of this, of course, is being done in the name of deterrence and maintaining 4,000 nuclear weapons, which is very questionable. And there's hardly any discussion about the economic impact of the site and how people are employed out there, sadly. The Savannah River site, like Hanford, Rocky Flats, and other nuclear weapons facilities, is a super fun site. That means it's considered one of the nation's most contaminated lands. The nuclear waste on this site and the storage of plutonium that never got converted to MOX poses a real danger to workers' health and the environment. There's 51 high-level waste tanks. And I would add that eight of those have already been emptied. So that's, that's a good step because they're the biggest threat at the site. So there's still a high level, uh, a high volume of nuclear waste. Uh, about 35 million gallons of high-level nuclear waste remain in their presence of many contaminated facilities and many contaminated dumping grounds on the, on the site. So that's an avenue for impacts to the workers, to the public, and to the environment. So there's always a looming threat of, uh, of, a, of a major tank leak or an explosion in the tanks due to hydrogen gas buildup or in the, the event of a nuclear criticality, say, with plutonium in production of, of new uh, pits for nuclear weapons, the core of the nuclear weapons. There's avenues for public impact, but I am not aware of any um, worker impact that's being analyzed right now, health impacts. There hasn't been anything in many years. So where do we look to see if there have been worker impacts? And the main place to go is to a worker compensation program that's administered by the Department of Labor 
under uh, the Energy Employee Occupation Illness Compensation Program Act. Now, this is the Department of Labor program. It's not DOE. But if you look at the figures that are updated weekly, you can see that there have been nearly 10,000 health uh, claims by workers who, wor who worked in the past at the Savannah River site. And over 2,000 of those workers have been allowed a claim by the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health to have had cancer caused by more than 50% probability by operation of the Savannah River site. Now, another 3,500 workers' claims have been denied from their cancer, but it, as we can see on that uh, Department of Labor site, over $2 billion, $2 billion have been paid out in claims for compensation and for medical claims by the workers. But this has really been gone, uh, it's, it's pretty much unreported because this is a Department of Labor program. And I've raised this many times at DOE meetings and I get the ridiculous answer Oh, that's the Department of Labor program. That's not DOE. We don't know anything about that. And basically, that's all that's said. And the media, unfortunately, hasn't discussed this hardly at all. But there are clear impacts to the workers who've worked at Savannah Riverside. That's the economic and health impact of the Savannah Riverside. Now let's get into the politics of it all. Over the course of 11 years, the MOX project survived many threats to its existence, despite its long record of mismanagement and other red flags. Investigations into the project by South Carolina newspaper, Post and Courier, found that the project survived thanks to the influence of a handful of powerful lawmakers in South Carolina and their allies. Many of those lawmakers benefited from campaign donations by the companies with a financial stake in the project. According to an analysis by the Center for Public Integrity, the Political Action Committee, formed by the project's main contractor, Mock Services, which was a joint venture between the Shaw Group and Arriva SA, spent at least $21.1 million on in-house and outside lobbyists between 2001 and 2012. The Political Action Committee also contributed at least $582,000 in campaign donations. Chicago Bridge, the Netherlands-based company which eventually bought Shaw, provided at least $2.2 million during this time. In total, Shaw, Areva, and Chicago Bridge spent at least 416000 on members of four committees that controlled spending on the MOX plant. Among South Carolina's lawmakers, Lindsey Graham Campaign and Leadership Committee received $41,500 while Representative Joe Wilson received 26000 Senator Graham and Representative Wilson, top advocates for MOX, held influential positions in Congress that gave them the ability to keep the project alive, even after the DOE had requested to end MOX. Wilson was one of the most senior Republicans on the House Armed Services Committee, which controls the country's defense spending. Graham sat on committees that decided the budget of nuclear programs. A lot of politics were involved in the MOX project and keeping the money flowing. Uh, and Senator Lindsey Graham, yes, he was uh, one of the primary ones for keeping, as another member of Congress, chided the MOX zombie going really long after it, it was dead. I mean, we knew it was dead. I was getting so many calls from workers. They didn't become official whistleblowers, but we knew the project was in deep trouble. But Senator Graham stepped up to keep it as alive long beyond the time period when it, it, it should have collapsed. So when it was terminated, basically in 2017 by DOE, but the courts didn't allow that to 2018, Senator Graham fought to keep it alive. But then when it was actually killed, what do we see? The contractor stepped forward and all of a sudden there's this announcement, we're going to turn SRS into a, a pit plant along with Los Alamos National Lab. It had never been discussed before. But what they wanted to do was keep the tap of $500 million a year or more, now it's over a billion, going to the contractors to keep some big project alive. And the Department of Energy's lifeblood is large capital intensive projects. And that's exactly what MOX was. And that's exactly what the PIT project is. And now the PIT project at Savannah River site is getting, I think it's $1.2 billion request. Uh, for this year, along with the cleanup, which is a billion dollars. 
So Savannah Riverside is now turning into a nuclear weapons facility as the cleanup kind of phases out. But it's it's all due to the politics of keeping, you know, a billion dollars a year flowing to the contractors at the site, unfortunately. And that main contractor is Savannah River Nuclear Solutions, I, I would add. And and most people don't know this is happening because really the media around Savannah Riverside does not conduct any journalism anymore. On the exact same day that Department of Energy scrapped the MOX project in 2018, the National Nuclear Security Agency announced that it would recommend the plant be repurposed to produce plutonium pits, the cores of nuclear weapons. From swords to plowshares, back to swords, one could even call it. The agency plan is to open a new plutonium pit production plant at Savannah River site that will operate for a minimum of 50 years and provide no fewer than 80 plutonium pits per year by 2030, along with plutonium pit production at Los Alamos National Laboratory in New Mexico. It's part of the overall effort by the U.S. to modernize and replace its nuclear arsenal. How the community reacted to the proposal about plutonium pit production is really remarkable and I think came alive in the 2019 environmental impact hearing um, that I was able to get a transcript of. And you really can see it neatly line up that all the town's boosters came out. I remember someone from the local United Way spoke in it and talked about how the SRS was so very important and, you know, would host softball tournaments to raise money for the United Way. So there's often these very local civic elements that don't have some explicit position on militarization and nuclear weapons, but have developed, you know, a tie to that local installation and would come out to defend it. And, you know, and for example, the community, the head of the community reuse organization spoke in favor of pit production at this hearing, which was, you know, made my jaw drop. (laughs) But then you had a remarkable array also of locals who came out, most of whom did not have an institutional affiliation, an institutional stake in the Savannah River site and its contractors who, you know, spoke with remarkable, you know, very fervently against the pit production facility. Many of them, of course, were motivated by opposition to nuclear weapons, but others were motivated by the boondoggle of the MOX plant and said, look, you spent how many billions on the MOX plant and it never turned on a single light bulb? Now you're claiming to us you're going to make pits? They just didn't believe it. So I think their motivation was often more of a fiscally conservative one or more of a um, taxpayer responsibility one. The cost estimate has drastically risen since the initial plutonium pit proposal. In 2017, the estimate was $3.6 billion for an 80 pit per year production capacity. In 2023, it rose to $11.1 billion for a 50 pit per year capacity. And while the original goal was to have the Savannah River site plan open by 2030, that date has now been moved to 2036. A 2023 audit by the Government Accountability Office determined that regarding the plutonium pit production project, Quote, the NNSA has not developed either a comprehensive schedule or a cost estimate that meets the GAO's best practices. That's extremely concerning, especially with the death of the failed MOX project so fresh. But some local residents find it difficult to voice their concerns or find ways to communicate with their representatives about the plutonium production plans for Savannah Riverside, even if they do have the chance to talk face to face. For my reporting on this story, I was able to get access to a DOE transcript of a public hearing about the environmental impact of turning the MOX plant into a plutonium pit production plant. And so just to sort of give some background, these kind of hearings, locals don't get many chances to officially voice their concerns about their local nuclear weapons plants. Those happen very few and far between. So when they happen, they're often quite robust and quite raucous when you finally get to actually speak to your own local government officials. So in 2019, I will say the, you know, in the transcript, I could see that both all the local boosters came out and all the local opponents came out. And it was a very rich, rich hearing on the matter. One local horse farm owner named Pete LaBurge told me he went into the hearing and he, you know, expected that the DOE's role would be something of a neutral one, you know, a convener of the hearing. But instead, he went in there and he saw that many of the sort of contractors and the interested parties had booths set up promoting the pit production plant. 
And it made him feel uncomfortable. It made him feel as though he were going into an election booth on voting day or at a polling site on voting day, and as though candidates were actively campaigning inside the polling place, which we all know is illegal and you can't do. You can't set up your campaign's uh, signs within a certain, you know, footage or a certain distance of the polling site. So it made him very uncomfortable. It made him feel like the boosters actually got to have, you know, a presence to influence people on the spot in front of this hearing, which, like I said, is a rare chance for locals to actually get to speak out about what they believe and what they want for their own town. So at DOE sites, after the end of the Cold War, the federal government encouraged local sites to set up what would be called community reuse organizations. And taxpayers funded these. And a community reuse organization, as its name suggests, is something of a swords in the plowshares organization, an economic conversion organization. It was to chart an economic future for that locality, not so dependent on nuclear weapons. So again, and that was at the end of the Cold War, so three decades plus ago, and I was surprised to find out that the community reuse organization at the Savannah River site is still active and still alive and well. However, it doesn't appear to be advocating for reuse. It appears it is advocating indeed for a return to the old use, which it is advocating for the plutonium pit production facility, i.e. resurrecting the nuclear weapons uh, mission at the Savannah River site. And when I asked the CRO if I could go to its meetings, they told me, no, our meetings are not a, a public forum for these types of discussions, which, which blew me away that what, what was intended to be a nonprofit and a space for public interest discussions about the economic futures of these sites indeed was not actually meant to be a place where the public could attend. So anyhow, this, is, this was fascinating to me that the community reuse organization still exists. However, the, the reuse portion of it is no longer appears to be much of its mission. And it reminded me a bit of a similar Pentagon agency that was called the Office of Economic Adjustment which used to be an agency that would help wean localities off of their dependence on the weapons economy. For example, when if a, if a BRAC closure closed their local base, or if Congress was appropriating less funds for the weapon that town made. Um, but in recent years, that agency has been renamed the Office of Local Defense Community Cooperation and appears to not have the adjustment, if you will, the economic adjustment uh, mission that it once had. The difficulties of finding information about the impact of plutonium production underscores the critical role of watchdog organizations like Savannah Riverside Watch and people like Tom Clemens. Well, the Department of Energy at the various sites, including Savannah Riverside, does put out an environmental monitoring report on a yearly basis. So that can be found, but you have to be able to read through the lines to know what exactly is going on. But there is some information available if you go to srs.gov. But the documents that are about details of programs or potential impact or say the plutonium pit production program, you've really got to file a FOIA request because if somebody picks up the phone, in my opinion, and calls the uh, Office of External Affairs at the Savannah River site, they're not going to get the answer that they want. They may be told, oh, sorry, you'll have to file a four-year request or you'll have to contact headquarters. And on my experience, there's nobody to contact in headquarters. So you have to file a four-year request. In the past, I didn't have to do that. I could just ask the public affairs officer and I could get some information. That's not the case anymore. And I don't think the DOE management, particularly Secretary Granholm, is aware of this, but it really needs to, to be addressed. Somebody told me, uh, just two days ago that they had just filed their very first FOIA request with the Department of Energy. And I, I hope they stay in touch with me and they may have to end up file, filing an appeal if they don't get a proper answer. And that's what often happens. We have to appeal the decisions to a higher level. Tom has been filing FOIAs, Freedom of Information Act requests, for decades now. And it's made him worry about transparency and openness in regards to the government's nuclear program. Well, this is a point of great concern to me because I think access to information is actually getting worse. Now, I, over the years, I've filed dozens and dozens of Freedom of Information Act requests with the Department of Energy and other state and federal uh, institutions. And one reason that we have to file for your request is that access to information and documents that should be a matter of public record are being withheld from the public. And DOE has no online library where documents are posted on a daily basis. And I'll contrast with this with the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission. 
Now, that is a regulatory agency, and they regulate nuclear reactors. But on a daily basis, and I review these documents, they post hundreds of documents that the public can see. DOE posts hardly anything unless they're doing some kind of environmental review. So we're forced to use the Freedom of Information Act because there is no clear way for the public to access important information. And while FOIA sometimes works, in large part, it tends to break down. And I've got several FOIAs in right now that I've been waiting on for years for a response, or they're being totally ignored. And I ask them, hey, what's the status of my FOIA request? No response. And I think this reflects that the leadership of DOE and the National Nuclear Security Administration are not engaged enough to make sure that their own agency is being responsive to FOIA requests. Um, and I think it's up to Secretary of Energy Granholm and NNSA Administrator Jill Ruby to make sure that FOIA is working and that the offices around the DOE sites are responding to requests. But that's not happening right now. So it's, it's not a good situation. So it's a struggle to get information out of DOE. But I, I fight it basically every day. So with the billions of dollars that went down the drain because of the MOX project mismanagement and the billions of dollars needed for the government's plutonium pit program, what does accountability look like today? Yeah, well, that's a great question because this was a huge blow to the Department of Energy. What, what they proposed was to make a facility uh, at Savannah River site called the uh, mixed oxide MOX fuel plant to make plutonium fuel for nuclear power reactors out of that surplus plutonium. So from 2007, I believe, to 2018, the Department of Energy wasted $5 billion on the construction of the MOX plant. I mean, we saw it was not going to go anywhere. It was going to fall apart long before the, court, the courts allowed it to be officially canceled in 2018. So over $5 billion was wasted on construction of the MOX plant. So I filed FOIA requests trying to get what are called lessons learned along the way in the mismanagement of the project, both by DOE and by the contractors. But sadly, to no surprise, I got nothing. I got no responsive documents. What they did provide me was documents on the lessons they learned on how they closed out the project, not on how they mismanaged the project. So there's nothing in the public realm uh, as far as lessons learned on how that project failed. And this is something that the Government Accountability Office has pointed out, that DOE cannot manage these large, complex problems. So unfortunately, what happened with this debacle was swept under the rug. And we tried to get congressional hearings about this. We got nothing. Nobody in Congress has held a hearing or, to my knowledge, has investigated what happened with the MOX project. But unfortunately, right now, what are they doing? They're looking at converting that MOX building, which sits there half finished, into a facility to make the plutonium pits the plutonium cores of nuclear weapons without having reviewed what happened with the MOX boondoggle. And in the DOE budget uh, presentation for FY25 and in recent congressional testimony by uh, Administrator Ruby, they want to spend up to $25 billion, $25 billion, converting that facility, the MOX facility, into a nuclear bomb plant. And that means 30 billion dollars would have been sunk in the single building. And as far as we can determine, this is the single most expensive building in U.S. history. And you would think somebody would have investigated what happened, or if this is the right thing to do, purely from an economic standpoint or a management standpoint, and that has not happened. So what does accountability look like? I I'm afraid I just outlined it. In the, in the case of the MOX project and what's happening with the pit plant, there really is no accountability. Congress has basically stepped away from its responsibility on monitoring what happened with the MOX project and what is now going on with the, the pit project. And, you know, we're headed in the wrong direction. And unfortunately, project mismanagement, cost overruns, and continual schedule delays, 
as I mentioned, outlined by the Government Accountability Office, are, are, are the standard for the Department of Energy. And Secretary Granholm simply has not wrapped her hands around this problem, unfortunately. The government is chugging along with its plutonium pit production plan at the Savannah River site. It can make the path towards nuclear modernization in the U.S. seem inescapable. But there are steps we can take to make our future a more peaceful one. So after all of this, what should people know about the Savannah River site and nuclear accountability? And if you'd like to read more about the Savannah River site, uh, I wrote a piece in 2022 that was a deep dive into the failed MOX plant turned into the plutonium pit production plant. I compared it alongside to another town that also had to contend with a dip in military spending, which was Brunswick, Maine, and had an absolutely different economic future, both of which would receive funds from the DOE for more experimental projects, MOX being one in South Carolina and the in Brunswick, Maine, funds for renewable energy um, energy startups. And in the piece you'll see, I, I guess I'll give away the ending, but that a tiny fraction of the money spent on the renewable energy startups in Brunswick has indeed produced remarkable technology that is powering whole you know, indigenous villages nowadays with the river turbine technology, or as the MOX, you know, MOX plant never turn on a single light bulb. So I hope that can be a bit of a story about different ways that investment in energy can play out. The first thing people at least here need to know, and I, I would say nationally, because we're a key part of the new nuclear arms race. People tend to forget about the Department of Energy side of things, and they only look at the Department of Defense. But the Department of Energy is the agency that makes the nuclear weapons for DOD, and people tend to forget about that. Here in South Carolina, I occasionally at random will walk up to people, people that look friendly, and ask them, what do you know about the Savannah River site? Have you heard about the Savannah River site? And half the time they'll pause and they'll go, no, I don't know what that is, or no, I've heard about it. Or a common answer from the older people is, oh, I thought that was closed. And they're confused. They think it was closed when we stopped the reactors from operating. But so much else has happened. So, you know, I, I'm willing to be the person that suffers through all those FOIA requests and all that complex information if people will pay more attention to the fact that we're now a key part of the new nuclear arms race. So that's the thing we're, we're tasked with now is trying to alert people, particularly here in South Carolina and Georgia, because Georgia is just right across the river, is that Savannah River site is on the rebound as far as it being a site of production for nuclear weapons materials or the pits and components. We're part of the Alliance for Nuclear Accountability, and we're involved in a big environmental lawsuit with two organizations that are part of ANA, Nuclear Watch New Mexico and Tri-Valley Cares in California. And we have a big federal lawsuit now asking for a full environmental review of the production of those plutonium pits for nuclear weapons and, and environmental justice impacts as well. We have a big filing coming up and there could be actual a court hearing in federal court here in Columbia, South Carolina, and if either side wins or loses, this could be appealed up through the appellate process all the way to the Supreme Court. That happened with the Mox case. It went all the way to the Supreme Court. So I want members of the public, particularly here in South Carolina, to know that we're going to have a highly visible case going before the federal court. It's been dragging on for almost three years, and that they need to come down to the court to support us if that happens, and we'll be putting the word out about it. But another place where people should just check out to see a lot that's going on with Savannah Riverside is uh, my organization's website called Savannah Riverside Watch, srswatch.org. And there's a lot of stuff that's being posted on there. Uh, and most recently about DOE's expansion and production of and processing of tritium for nuclear weapons and all the processing of all that tritium happens at the site. But SRS what? Watch.org is a great place to go for information. The U.S. currently possesses about 5,000 nuclear weapons in its arsenal. It's aiming to replace its aging nuclear stockpile. That's why there's a push for plutonium pit production at Savannah River site. But the failure of the MOX project at the Savannah River site has shown us that we're unable to dispose of these weapons as well as we can create them. 
The legacy and waste of nuclear weapons made during the Cold War at Savannah River site and around the country has still yet to be addressed. The last original residents of Aiken left by 1952, but one resident by the name of Bonner Smith, before leaving, erected a homemade sign made out of gum boards on the top of the Ellington Incorporated sign. Written in shoe polish, it read, It is hard to understand why our town must be destroyed to make a bomb that will destroy someone else's town that they love as much as we love ours. Thank you to our guests, Tom Clements from Savannah Riverwatch and Taylor Barnes from Inkstick Media. To learn more about Savannah Riversite, visit srswatch.org or check out Taylor Barnes' report on the Savannah Riversite called America's Military Industrial Oligarchy versus Our Small Towns. And thank you for listening to Nuke Talk, brought to you by Plowshares. To support our work on the podcast and in making our world safer from the nuclear threat, visit plowshares.org. And see you next episode.